Okay, this is uh, part four of my video series, long video series, looking at Russ Miller's 50 Facts of Darwinism, something, 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 whatever the title is. Uh, I don't know why I can't remember that, but what the hell. All right, uh, we were talking about the impossibility of abiogenesis and life, so here we go. Now, proteins are the primary components of cells. And they're usually made up of 20 different, very specific, all left-handed amino acids that have all right-handed nucleotide sugars. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh. Okay, that's not nice. It's really, really, really rude of me. Um, I wonder, uh, Mr. Miller, was nucleotide sugar on your creationist word of the day calendar or something like that? Um, because if it was, you might have, it, hopefully it included the definition, because I don't think it means what you think it means. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail about what nucleotide sugars are. They have fuck all to do with protein structure, okay? Just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it just, it's, it's laughable. It, it's a word, that, it's a, it's a real important sounding word, isn't it? Uh, it makes you sound like you know what you're talking about, um. Um, I'm sure the audience was, you know, completely impressed with your, 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 prof your, I didn't show all of the cases of it, but your, your prodigious use of the word nucleotide sugar. Like letters in a sentence, they have to be in a specific order and facing the right direction to have any meaning at all. The letters that make up in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth convey meaning. However, if you mix up the same letters, they convey they convey no meaning whatsoever. The odds of coming up with this line using randomly dropped Scrabble letters is 1 in 2,810 trillion octillion. In other words, it is mathematically completely impossible. So that's a pretty interesting little experiment. Um, so the odds of randomly dropping Scrabble letters and getting the phrase, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, is whatever you said it was, um, 1 in 2,810 2, trillion octillion. Um, that's a pretty big number. Uh, and I, I actually honestly have no reason to doubt that that number is accurate. And you know why? The reason why is because, uh, first of all, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth has five H's, um, and uh, Scrabble only has two H's in it. And even the smallest known protein is actually made up of hundreds of these left-handed amino acids with right-handed nucleotide sugars. So the smallest protein is made of hundreds of left-handed amino acids and right-handed <laughs> right uh, nucleotide sugars? Sorry, it slays me whenever I hear you say that. Uh, that's kind of... Well, wrong. The <laughs> besides the nucleotide sugar third again, uh, but uh, hundreds of amino acids. The the that's that's not the smallest protein. The smallest known naturally occurring protein is called TRP cage and is actually one of the toxins in saliva of the lizard called the Gila monster, um, and it's twenty amino acids long. Twenty amino acids. 20 left-handed amino acids long and no no nucleotide sugars. Um, that The smallest uh, man-made protein, a functioning protein, uh, is a 10 amino acid protein. In fact, one mathematician estimated the odds of just one protein forming on its own in nature to be, and this is if we started with all the 20 left-handed amino acids, and we're given 15 billion years for it to take place, the odds would be 10 to the 60th power. Well, what kind of a number is that? Well, 10 to the 50th power is considered absolute zero. That number would account for every molecule in the entire universe. And that's the odds of just one protein forming on its own. The supposed simplest cell requires 600 specific proteins. In other words, there is no mathematical possibility these formed on their own. So a mathematician calculated the odds of a single protein assembling itself from random amino acids. Um, and that's a pretty big number. Uh, by the way, 
it's not called absolute zero just for your information a number a number that's a probability that's that vanishingly small is not called absolute zero that's a, a different word but anyway well the good news is thanks to your mathematician i suspect it's fred hoyle but i'm not positive about that but the good news is is that those calculations are 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 done and in place so on that day someday in the long distant future when an actual working biologist makes the claim that proteins complex proteins spontaneously assemble themselves we'll have a response ready for it that that's 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 awesome you know in case that day happens because you know what nobody's ever suggested that that's how it worked um what you're doing is proposing a straw man you're proposing that we believe that in this primordial soup all of the proteins of life somehow self-assembled themselves by some magical means um, in preparation for the first cell forming. Um, that's not true. Since they say we started out as a supposed simple bacteria cell, let's take a quick look at a bacteria cell. The science of biochemistry has found that bacteria cells are actually run by tiny molecular motors called bacterial flagellum. These tiny molecular motors allow the cell to swim around and perform its various functions. It can even change gears depending on how much weight it's towing or pushing. Now these are made up of about 40 very specific and very complex proteins and they're known as irreducibly complex. That means if any one part of any of the proteins is missing, the entire system would fail. You have to have all the proteins complete and in the right order at the very start of life to form the flagellum or life could not have started on its own. Wow, so where to begin with this? Um, it sounds from that brief description there that Russ Miller is under, the, uh, believes, uh, first of all, that that E. coli, which is the picture shown, um, represents a simple bacteria. Um, e. coli is, is actually one of the eubacteria and is fairly advanced, and in fact is quite advanced. So really is not a very good model for the earliest primitive cell. So the second question I would ask Mr. Miller, if I were speaking to him directly, is do you think that all bacteria cells or all cells, all single cells have flagella? Um, that they're critical for the evolution of life, that they're critical for life at all? I mean, do you really think, I mean, when you, the way you worded that, you talked about how the proteins have to be in order and all present for life to evolve. Um, sounds like you have this idea that the flagella is some critical component for life. Um, it's not. In fact, the irony is you're showing um, E. coli. Um, it a lot of E. coli strains are non-motile, don't have a flagella at all. Now, the majority of, of known strains of E. coli do have a flagella, but not all of them do. Um, a lot of bacteria have motile and non-motile strains, and a lot of them are just simply non-motile. Um, a lot of the, what do you call it, the, um, the blue-greens, for example, a lot of them are non-motile at all. They have no flagella apparatus. Um, also, what you're ignoring is you're looking at the flagella of the eubacteria, not the flagella of the um, archaean bacteria or the flagella of the eukaryotes, um, all very, very different structures with different um, origins. To make matters worse for naturalistic Darwinism, the process of putting the flagellum together in the right order requires other molecular motors that are themselves irreducibly complex. In other words, the more real science gets into the cell, the more completely impossible Darwinism becomes. It's pretty clear that Miller doesn't quite understand the meaning of the word irreducibly complex, as we will see in a little bit here. Uh, but before I go on, I thought it would be good to explain a little bit. When the claim is made that a cellular structure is irreducibly complex, that carries with it a whole bunch of assumptions that have to be met. Um, and so far, the fact is, Russ... Not one of those systems, not one of the proposed systems has ever been shown to be irreducibly complex. Every one of Behe's examples has been shown to be reducible, okay? That's first of all. So there, as far as we know, there are no truly, in the Behe sense, irreducibly complex systems. There are systems that we call irreducibly complex, um, but we know the pathways by which they arise. Uh, 
But by Behe's definition, that means irreducibly complex means no part can be removed and have the system still function. And this is the important difference with Behe's definition of irreducibly complex is that there's there are no plausible pathways for this structure to develop stepwise. OK, this means that there's no an irreducibly complex system in Behe's definition. There's no scaffolding put possible. There's no way for it to be put together um, unless it was divinely created. That's that's Behe's. They're pretty close to Behe's definition. I might not be exactly dead on with it, but it's close enough. Now, humanists are going to claim that parts of the flagellum. I'm curious about what what business does a humanist have commenting on molecular biology? Now, humanists are going to claim that parts of the flagellum are found in the bubonic plague bacterium, and that these parts were co-opted to form the flagellum. So they're going to say that these parts formed on their own and came together for the flagellum later on. However, only 10 of the 40 parts of the flagellum have been found elsewhere. The other 30 are brand new. The 10 components he's referring to are the TTSS, uh, which is the type 3 secretory system of bacteria, uh, a lot of the pathogenic bacteria. It's what they use to inject toxins into a host cell. Um, that's the 10 that he's talking about, whether it be 10 of 30 or 10 of 40. Um, of the proteins. But then to say that the rest of them are all new, that's not true, Russ. I'm not sure if you're misreading your sources, misunderstanding your sources, or just kind of making stuff up. Um, but the fact of the matter is, there's a large number of proteins in the, in the bacteria flagellum that have very, very close homologs in other systems. Lots of them, okay? Um, just, just look up a few functional homologs of tubulin, of flagellin. Look up ATPases associated with diverse cellular functions, or AAAs, uh, and their relationship to dynin. And scientific research has proven that the plague's bacteria apparatus came from the de degeneration of the flagellum. So don't let somebody mislead you and tell you that the uh, flagellum co-opted its parts for the parts already existed, they did not. Scott Minich proved this? I'd love to see that reference. Um, Scott Minich has asserted that. I've never seen it proven. The fact that you use the word proven shows that you're kind of talking out of your ass. Nothing's proven in science anyways. Um, but there's a, there's a, here's the big problem with that. Here's the, there's a number of problems with that claim. But again, if, if Minich actually had the scientific evidence the actual published papers to demonstrate that the the type three secretory system in in bacteria, um, in in had actually devolved from a flagellum, um, it'd be pretty big news. Okay, trust me, he hasn't done it. There's a whole lot of evidence that it went the other way. The type three sec secretory system, and there's a number of variations of it, have components in varying degrees of the flagellum, but. The important part about it, and this is where I, it's pretty clear that I don't think you even, I don't think you know where you went wrong in it, um, is you're, you're talking about a system that uses, you said 10 of, 10 of the 30, 10 of the 40, um, according to Behe, it's 10 of 30, but that, that's okay. That's all right. Um, I don't know, 30, 40 doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but 10 of the parts of the bacterial flagellum have an extremely important and useful function for the cell that's not involved in propelling the cell around. Um, do you realize that by saying that that's true, whether it went from the flagellum to the to the, the TTSS or the other way around, it doesn't make any difference. Either way, you're just admit you've just admitted that by the definition of irreducibly complex, the flagellum is not an irreducibly complex system. Okay? Do you see that? Do you, do you see your, the error? When you say, well, that certain parts of it can have a completely unrelated function that function perfectly well with only one third of its components intact, you're saying that uh, the system in the first place was never irreducibly complex because it's been reduced and it's still working. Different function, but it's still working. 